Hey, homework, good morning. We're so excited to have you here with us this morning online on Facebook or on YouTube, wherever you're watching this. We're really excited to have you here. Um, amid all this craziness, we start to see hope on the horizon, and we, we hope in being able to meet and being able to be around each other, maybe at some point in the future. So we're really excited about that here coming up, and we're really excited that you're here today. Um, you, we would love to have you guys stay connected with us through this time of online services. There's some information on the board behind me um, with the phone number, Facebook, Instagram, and the website, so all great ways to stay in touch with us. And also, be sure to check in the description below this video. Um, we also have on there where you can fill out your Connect card and stay connected with us here at Homeport. Let's pray as we go into our worship. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for your people being able to gather together online with you um, and for you. Father, I just pray that you would help our worship to be excellent and help our worship to be pointed at you, Father. And I pray that you would be with us and guide our hearts through this time of worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Homeport. It's so great to see you online this morning. So glad that you could join us. Please lift your voices up and sing praises to our wonderful Lord.
finished up with communion, I wanted to, to just say something about our offering time. Here at Homeport, we're in this unique position. At the south end of St. Augustine, to be this force in our community. And we, we, have, we have been that force of, of Christ. We have, we have filled that role, and we're so excited to continue to do that. And it's with y'all's support and your generosity to this church that allows us to do this. And this week, during our offering time, I wanted to highlight something you all can do to just get involved in your community. And that is to reach out to those people that you know live nearby, your neighbors, coworkers, and see if they need something. As you continue to be generous here, we ask that you would be generous with your time out there, out where you live, out in your neighborhoods, and, and some, for some of you, your city. We just ask that you would be generous with your time and generous with your funding for us. We have a few simple ways to give this week at home for it, ranging from calling and dropping off a check all the way to simply making an online payment. There's pretty much every um, available step in between there. If you need help with any of the options listed on screen right now, just give us a call. 904 797 8921. We'd be glad to help you out in any way that we possibly can. Now let's pray for Ben as he comes to deliver the message. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for, for Pastor Ben. Thank you so much for our amazing worship team. Lord, thank you for all of our abilities to come together and praise you. In various ways, Lord, I pray for Ben as he comes up to deliver your message, Lord, I pray that you give him the words to speak and that you would give him the authority with which to speak them, Lord. I just pray that you would bless us and keep us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's so good to be with you today. Though not in person, we're still online. If you're a first-time guest with us, we want to welcome you to our online uh, church that we're having today as we have come and we've gathered together to worship our Lord and our Savior and to proclaim his good news. I don't know if you uh, were a part of the tidal wave last year, but last year, a uh, tidying up with Marie Kondo was a Netflix hit. Her phrase, if it doesn't bring you joy, get rid of it, was mentioned everywhere. And there were all kinds of articles that talked about the boom that uh, our uh, thrift stores across the nation saw as, uh, don as donations increased, as people got rid of these things, which she said, if they don't bring you joy, you get rid of it. And so you sell it, or you donate it, or you give it away. And, uh, and as people watched and purged, these thrift stores began to just see a, just a huge increase in donations. And, and what she was uh, proclaiming was a form of simplicity called minimalism. And minimalism has taken hold of the American psyche. And I wonder, though, how many of us actually watched the show, maybe you read her book, uh, which came out first, and, and began to purge your joyless possessions. I tried to get my wife Dawn to watch the, movie, or the show on Netflix with me, but she absolutely refused. She did not want to go through her stuff. She did not want to purge it. She did not want to get rid of it. But I wonder, did you go through that process? Did you go through the process of purging your stuff and getting rid of it? I imagine, though, for those that did, that new lifestyle was actually pretty short-lived. See, we weren't raised to live with less. No, actually just the opposite. See, we've been taught to believe that joy, or should I say happiness, is found not in less stuff, but in more stuff, in an all-out pursuit of more. We've been conditioned to desire more, to want more. Paul Mauser, a Wall Street banker at uh, Lehman Brothers, said this. He says, we must shift America from a needs to a desires culture. People must be retrained to desire, to want new things, even before the old have been entirely consumed. We must shape a new mentality. Man's desires must overshadow his needs. And now that sounds like something that could have been written in the 80s. Maybe the 90s, it could have been even written in the last few years. But I wonder, when do you think Mazur said this? Would you believe that he said it in 1927? 
In the late 20s, before the Great Depression started, this was the sentiment of business leaders that were driving the American culture from a production culture of farmers to a consumer culture. And it worked. When you go back and you look, those that, that were raised or grew up with so little during the Great Depression, Depression, they became some of the greatest consumers of all times, hoarding houses full of stuff. See, during World War II, the Nazis used propaganda to appeal to the German people's unconscious drives rather than their rational thoughts. They learned these principles, ironically, from a Jewish psychotherapist named Sigmund Freud. Hitler worked on the German people's two most basic emotions, want and fear. And after World War II, Freud's nephew, Edward Bernays, brought those ideas to America. He believed that if the Nazis could manipulate people during wartime, that business leaders and politicians could use the same principles to manipulate people during times of peace. We don't call it propaganda anymore. Now we call it public relations. Bernays is now called the father of American advertising. Our emotions are used against us to teach us, to condition us, to want more even though we don't need it. A desire for more and a feeling of hurry go hand in hand. We can't get more unless we're willing to do more. We can't be a part of more unless we're willing to join more. Alan Falding says this, the drive to possess is the engine for hurry. And he's absolutely right. Go ahead and open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to spend our time this morning looking at this passage. Uh, but as we do, uh, we've been in a new series since Easter talking about Jesus' resurrection from death to life. Jesus promised a new life, a better way of life, an abundant life. And if he promised it to us, then why does it feel like we're living this abundant life? The answer is we haven't learned how to slow down, to simplify our lives to live out his new way of living. Last weekend, Jordan did a wonderful job of helping us to see that slowing down, that is resting and creating space for a, a Sabbath rest, is interwoven throughout the entire Bible, and it helps us understand God's plan for us. From God making the seventh day holy, a holy day of rest at the end of creation, all the way through to the end where we live in eternal rest when Jesus returns God created a rhythm of life that goes from rest to work and then all over again. But the problem is, is we try to work and then rest instead. This morning I want to talk about and continue this conversation that we're having to, about simplifying our lives. Not just getting rid of stuff, not just reducing our commitments but the releasing the need for more, the need to do more so that we can spend more time with God in His presence and enjoy the abundant life that He promises us. Here's the thing, we're never going to find that true abundant life if we're out there chasing more stuff. More stuff makes me think of George Carlin's old bit on stuff. And if you go on YouTube and you look it up, uh, don't be surprised by the number of four-letter words he uses. I'm pretty sure he can't form a sentence without one in there. But in the bit, he talks about how our homes are just a roof covering up our stuff, our pile of stuff. And he says you get on an airplane and you go and you fly above the city and all you see are these little piles of stuff covered by a roof. He goes on to talk about how we created a whole new industry because we couldn't house our stuff anymore. So we started uh, a business called Storage Units. And if you live in St. John's County, you can bet if they're building something new and it doesn't look like a neighborhood, it's actually a storage building because they're popping up everywhere. Whether that is, you go to the new huge one on 16 just past the outlet malls, or on the corner of 312 and A1A, where uh, the old storage unit expanded into the new lot so that they could have more storage units, or you go to the four-story storage unit just up the road from the building. They are everywhere. We've been conditioned to desire more, and we can't even keep it under our roofs or in our full garages anymore, so we have to pay someone to look after our stuff. We have to recognize that we've been conditioned this way. To feel bad if we don't have more, to feel bad if we're not busier, if our calendars aren't fuller, if there isn't, a, 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 or if we're not creating to-do lists that we'll fail to complete. 
we now respond to the question, how are you doing with, you know, busy, like it's a way of life. But this isn't the life that Jesus created us to live. There has to be more than this, because this isn't a life that feels rich and satisfying. He said that it would be, but this, this doesn't feel like the abundant life that we hope for. We wouldn't say that this life brings us delight and joy. It actually wears us out. We're exhausted. We're on the edge of burnout. And even if we don't feel tired from being busy all the time, can we look back at the way we use our time and our energy and our resources and say they're leading us to an abundant life? Because if we respond no to that, then there has to be more to this life. Go ahead and open up Matthew chapter 6. We're going to start down in verse 19. I'll give you a moment to get down to it. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 19. This is what he says. He says, Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroy them and where thieves break in and steal. No, he says, store your treasures in heaven where moth and rust can't destroy and thieves cannot break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. And Jesus is beginning to teach us this idea of simplicity. He says, don't store up treasures on earth. Why? Because they're going to wear out. Or they're going to be destroyed. Or they're going to be taken from us. And all of this stuff begins uh, to create worry in our lives. A number of years ago, uh, when we moved to Ohio, we, we lived with one of the elders of the church for a couple weeks as we were waiting on our house uh, to finish up so we could move in. And uh, the, this elderly couple, our friends Brian and Donna, they lived way out in the country. And uh, they never locked their doors. They never locked their doors. And when we moved there, it was like this like whole new fear set up. I was like, what do you mean you don't lock your doors? And how can you do that? And, but they never. They didn't lock their doors when they were gone. They didn't lock their doors at night when they were sleeping. They just never locked their doors. And while we were there living with them, there was a church conference down in Kentucky. And so the elders and the staff and a couple of the wives all went down. But Dawn and the kids stayed back in Ohio. And one of the days we were gone, Dawn left the house and she locked all the doors because that's what she did. And she locked all the doors and she got back and she realized she had locked herself out of the house. And she calls me in this great panic. And, uh, and she's like, hey, you need to ask them, do any of the family members or do any of their neighbors have a spare key? And so I did. And they were like, no, nobody has a spare key since we never lock our doors. And luckily, fortunately, uh, if you didn't lock your doors, you probably didn't lock your windows. And so they were able to jam, uh, to jimmy up a window and slide Judah in. And he was able to let them back in the house. Uh, but that's what Jesus is talking about. He says when we worry about all the stuff that we have, it creates all kinds of problems. And, and actually a couple of few funny, funny stories along the way. Jesus doesn't want us to worry about the temporary things that we will acquire here on earth. But, the treasure, but to treasure the things in heaven. And, and, and to, uh, to treasure those things that we store in the kingdom of God now. He continues on in verse 22. He says, the eye is like a lamp and provides light for the whole body. And when your eye is healthy, the whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if that light that you think you have is actually darkness, how deep is that darkness? And Jesus is talking about the darkness that we have as we desire more for ourselves. The storing up of treasures for ourselves here on earth, thinking that they make us more than we really are. He continues on in verse 24. He says, no one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. That is why I tell you not to worry about your everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? And he really gets to the heart of the matter. Our desire for more is really serving another God. He says you can't have your feet in both camps. You can't serve two masters. And when he does, and when we do, when we don't serve two masters, we're learning this new way to simplify our lives. He says, don't worry about your everyday life. Don't, weather, don't worry about whether or not you're going to have enough food and drink and clothes and toilet paper during this pandemic. Man, we failed that one, right? He asks, isn't there more to life than worrying about these things? If we're going to move from death to life, from desiring things we don't need in this case, to a life free from anxiety and the worry that they bring us, we have to choose Jesus' new way of life. And relearn now our how to be human. 
We've got to die to our old selves that, we've, that have been conditioned to want more so that we can live a new life of satisfaction, commitment, and joy found in Jesus alone. That's what it's going to take to uh, a commitment to relearn how to live in the kingdom of God. He says, look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in the barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't, they more, aren't you far more valuable than they are? Can all, the worries, can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why do, you, why do you worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon, in all of his glory, is not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the, flower, or to the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? And Jesus gives us this compare and contrast moment. He says, don't you think the only thing that has been created in God's image, don't you think that you are God's greatest masterpiece, the only ones that he died for? Don't you think that you are far more important than the birds of the air and the flowers of the field? Don't you think that when you look at the birds who don't have barns, store up food, yet they always seem to have food to eat, and the flowers of the field they looked so much more splendid than Solomon did in all of his glory, dressed in the finest clothes that money could buy at the time. Don't you think that if God provides for the birds of the, uh, of the air and the flowers of the field, then won't he provide that much more for us, his greatest creation? The answer is, of course he will. We just have to trust him and show that by trusting and not worrying. And as he comes to the end of the passage, he says, Don't worry about these things, saying, What will we eat, and what will we drink, and what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and live righteously, and he will give you everything that you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's troubles are enough for today. Jesus says, Don't worry. Don't continue to live conditioned and wanting more. Those who don't trust God worry about such things. But this is not the way that we've been called to live. We're not supposed to be worried or anxious about uh, the food on our table, the clothes on our back, even the roof over our head. He says your heavenly Father knows your needs and he will, provo he will provide them for you if you just trust him. He says there has to be a better way of life and that better way is to think or is to seek after to desire, to want, and to long for the kingdom of God. He says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will provide all that you need. I remember my first experience uh, into Haiti, and I remember there were these kids, and they were in the street. They had nothing. They had dirty clothes. They were eating one meal a day. They had no shoes, and yet they danced and sang in the streets with utter joy. In their churches, their worship was so full of life, and their singing and their dancing was so full of the Spirit. They didn't know to worry about the things that they didn't have. They got by, and that was enough for them. God provided what they needed, and they rejoiced. Yet we get so caught up worrying about these things, even worrying about tomorrow, never realizing that it's moving us from our, our, our true life, that life in the, the present moment that we've been given. Worrying about these things and the things of this world keep us from the joy and the satisfaction that is to be found in the life that Jesus offers us. So we want to move from death into life. We have to do as Tyler Durden uh, in the movie Flight Club suggests. He said this in the movie. He said, reject the basic assumptions of civilization, especially the importance of material possessions. And in the book that we've been studying alongside of the sermon series, Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, John Mark Comer responds to that quote with these questions. He said, what if the formula, more stuff equals more happiness, is actually bad math? He says, what if more stuff often equals more stress? What if more stuff actually equals less of what matters most? And what happens if we reject my culture's messaging that is a half-truth at best, not a full-on lie, and live another message? 
What is that message? That we reject the message of this world and we accept the one true gospel. That through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection from the grave, um, because God loved us so much, we have new life. And we can actually find the joy and the satisfaction that we've been looking for. We can find in life a life that is rich and full of the stuff that matters. An actual abundant life. What if we were to reject our conditioning and accept the life that Jesus promised us? What if we were to simplify our lives, not our, just our possessions, but our calendars as well? Not just that we would fill our homes with, but what are we filling our time with? Think about all the time and the energy and the resources we could have if we simplify our lives. Simplifying life is not just about our time and our money, but it's our whole life that we're thinking about. And I want to end this morning with a quote from Henry David Thoreau. And he says this, simplicity, simplicity, simplicity. I say, let your affairs be as two or three, not as a hundred or a thousand. Why should we live with such hurry and waste of life? And he's right. Why should we live in such a hurry and waste our life? When we know it doesn't, end, it doesn't lead to the life that we want and desire, why should we live in such a way? So we choose a different way. We choose first the kingdom of God, and we live righteously as he has called us to, and we trust that God will provide for our needs and not our conditioned wants. Why don't you pray with me this morning? Father God, as we come before you, as we come into this time where uh, we hear your word and we, we look at the teaching of Jesus. He teaches us a new way to be human here in the Sermon on the Mount. And one of the ways that he, he talks to us is about our possessions and our, our use of money and our time and our energy and, and, and wanting more and more and more. But it doesn't lead to the life that he promised. He said that if we would just seek first after your kingdom and if we would live the way that you have called us to live, you would give us what we need. Father, we want to learn that that is enough. Father, I pray this morning that you would speak into our, into our hearts, into our spirits this morning, and show us this new way to live. Give us a glimpse of that abundant life because we've slowed down, because we're simplifying the things around us. We're not chasing after more. We're not filling up our calendars with more. But we're creating space for you to work in our everyday life, to be in your presence. Be, to be there and to be reminded that you love us because we are us, not because of what we accomplish, not because of the things that we possess. Father, take these worries and these anxieties away from us. And I pray that you would just be with us in these moments. Teach us what it means to simplify our lives. Help us to, to see these words and then to them speak into our spirit this morning. Father, we love you and we thank you for this time where we can gather together like this. And we pray this in your son's name. Amen. I want to thank you all for joining us online this morning. Uh, it is a shame that we are still not able to gather together, uh, but at least we can gather in this way. I do want to invite you all to join us on our Zoom Wednesday night online Bible study. We'd love to see you there to be a part of that. Um, and it is a great way for us to gather together midweek, even though we can't be together in the same room at this time. We love you all. Hope you guys have a wonderful week, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you.